Today, on It Takes a Killer, a string of mysterious disappearances plagued the state of Colorado for more than a year. Law enforcement investigates the incidents as separate cases until they find an unusual connection which reveals all the missing persons to be victims of the same killer. Glendale, Colorado, early February 2003. 25-year-old exotic dancer Jennifer Markham goes to a coffee shop to finally meet a man named Scott Kimball, who she's been corresponding with for several weeks. Kimball has a long history of white-collar crimes across the western United States, including Montana, Washington, and Alaska. Kimball also happens to be a former cellmate of Jennifer's boyfriend, Steve Ennis, who's currently incarcerated at Englewood Prison. Ennis told Jennifer that Kimball was someone she could trust. Scott Kimball and Jennifer Markham meet a few more times. When Jennifer relays to Scott how tired she is of her current career, he tells her he's got connections with a coffee cart business in Seattle that offers high earnings. Jennifer's intrigued by the possibility and she wants to give it a shot. In mid-February, Jennifer moves all of her furniture into Kimball's condo in preparation for a one-way trip to Seattle. What Jennifer doesn't know is that Kimball is an FBI informant who's been specifically released from Englewood Federal Correctional Institute to keep tabs on her because she's a potential government witness in a drug case the FBI is building against her boyfriend. Denver, Colorado, Friday, February 21st, 2003. Scott Kimball reports to the local FBI office to meet his case officer, Special Agent Carl Schlaff. Kimball tells Schlaff that Jennifer Markham traveled to New York City to purchase a handgun with the intent of shooting a federal witness in her boyfriend's case. Special Agent Schlaff starts looking into Markham's trip out of town. Schlaff quickly discovers Markham's car has been in a parking lot at the Denver International Airport since February 18th. However, there's no record of her getting on any outbound flights that day. Jennifer Markham has disappeared. By mid-March 2003, there's still no signs of Jennifer Markham. Making matters worse, Scott Kimball's about to be sent back to federal prison for white-collar crimes that landed him there in the first place. Since Special Agent Schlaff still needs Kimball's assistance for the Markham Ennis case, Kimball is able to cut a deal. He agrees to plead guilty to multiple counterfeit check charges in exchange for the lowest possible sentence, if he can continue being an informant for the FBI by keeping an eye out for Jennifer Markham. Over the next few months, Kimball remains out of prison, but reports nothing to the FBI. In May, with Jennifer Markham still MIA, the FBI gives up on their informant and revokes Kimball's protected status. A warrant is subsequently issued for his arrest. Denver police are also looking for Kimball as he's violated the terms of his probation from a felony forgery case in Spokane, Washington that dates back to 1999. Denver, Colorado, Thursday, June 19th, 2003. Scott Kimball is out running errands when police take him into custody and place him in Denver County Jail. Kimball tells law enforcement that a drug dealer named Jason Price, who's an associate of Steve Ennis, strangled Jennifer Markham to death. According to Kimball, Price even showed him pictures on his laptop of Jennifer's body with her hands and legs bound and her mouth taped shut. Kimball alleges that Price offered to pay him to dig up her body and remove Jennifer's IUD and breast implants, which both contained traceable serial numbers. Kimball is asked to take a polygraph. He passes. Special Agent Schlaff petitions the authorities in Spokane, Washington to drop their warrant against Kimball for probation violations so that he can remain in Colorado to assist in the Markham investigation. Kimball is subsequently released and his protected status is reinstated. Upon his release, Kimball shacks up with 39-year-old divorcee Lori McLeod in Broomfield, Colorado. He'd met McLeod back in February while gambling at the Lodge Casino. As Kimball rekindles his relationship with McLeod, he starts taking an interest in her 19-year-old daughter, Casey. Although Casey struggled with meth addiction in the past, that summer she's been in the process of turning her life around. She's even maintaining employment at a local subway. On August 21st, Kimball shows up unannounced at Lori's job. He shows her a vial of crystals he says belong to Casey, which he claims he found at the house. By the time Lori gets home, Casey has already taken off on her bicycle and checked into a Motel 6 with her boyfriend, Celestino Bowville. According to Celestino, two days later on the night of Saturday, August 23rd, Kimball picks up Casey at the motel, intending to give her a ride to her job at Subway. Casey never returns to the motel that night, 
Her boyfriend soon finds out that she never arrived at work for her shift. Worried, Celestino calls Lori McLeod. Lori makes multiple attempts to reach Scott that night, but he never answers his phone. When he finally picks up the next day, he refutes Beauville's account that he picked Casey up at the motel and claims he went to the mountains to scout bow hunting grounds. Lori McLeod is concerned about her daughter's whereabouts, but since she knows Scott Kimball is an FBI informant, she believes his story and hopes that he can influence his contacts with law enforcement to help find Casey. On Sunday, August 31st, 2003, just eight days after her daughter's disappearance, Lori McLeod and Scott Kimball drive to Las Vegas to tie the knot. Weeks go by with no sign of Casey. Then one day, Lori comes home to find one of her daughter's gold necklaces hanging off a doorknob. Shortly thereafter, on a separate day, Casey's makeup case goes missing. Lori's landlord tells her that he saw Casey and her boyfriend driving nearby. Kimball reassures his new wife that Casey must be around, but is probably just not ready to talk. By the end of 2003, Casey still hasn't returned home. In July 2004, Scott's eight and 10-year-old sons from a previous marriage come for a visit. The 10-year-old ends up getting a critical head injury, which will require him to spend weeks in the hospital and rehab. When Kimball's 60-year-old uncle Terry hears about his grandnephew's accident, he rushes from Alabama to Colorado to help out. Terry Kimball decides to stick around. He moves into Casey's bedroom as she's still missing. Late that summer, Lori McLeod Kimball returns home to find a sofa in the yard, which is covered in vomit. Scott tells his wife that his uncle's dogs created the mess. Neither of the dogs, Terry's truck or his uncle Terry, are anywhere in sight. When she asks Scott where his uncle is, Scott responds that Terry won the lottery and ran off to Mexico with a stripper. Terry Kimball is never heard from again. Coming up, a con on the run falls into the arms of the law. You're watching It Takes a Killer. Hey, I'm Between February and August 2003, 25-year-old Jennifer Markham and 19-year-old Casey McLeod vanish without a trace. Both women are connected to 36-year-old Scott Lee Kimball, an FBI informant who'd recently served time in federal prison. The FBI had sprung Kimball from prison in December 2002 so we could keep tabs on Jennifer Markham, who was a potential witness in a federal drug case being built against her boyfriend, Steve Ennis. Kimball had met Casey McLeod in February of 2003 when he started dating her mother, Lori. Just a week after Casey went missing that August, Scott married Lori in Las Vegas. Even though Kimball has several outstanding white-collar criminal cases, his protected status as an FBI informant has kept him out of jail. In the summer of 2005, Kimball's marriage starts to dissolve. He ends up moving out, returning to his hometown, Lafayette, Colorado, and eventually getting his own place. Kimball remains on the Bureau's payroll as an informant. He even receives a stipend for his move from the FBI. Lafayette, Colorado, Monday, January 16th, 2006. Optometrist Cleve Armstrong heads to the bank. He's shocked to find out that $83,000 had been transferred out of his money market account while he was away on vacation during the past three weeks. $55,000 of the missing money had been paid out in the form of checks to two businesses, Rocky Mountain All Natural Beef and Rocky Mountain Cattle Company. Scott Kimball owns both companies. The headquarters of Rocky Mountain All Natural Beef is next door to the bank in the same office building as Armstrong's optometry clinic. On Friday, January 20th, Lafayette Police Detective Gary Thatcher goes to Scott Kimball's office to investigate. Kimball's office is in the basement of the building near a poorly secured closet where Cleve Armstrong keeps sensitive financial records. Detective Thatcher digs around through Kimball's office trash can and finds several pieces of paper with what appears to be practice versions of Cleve Armstrong's signature. Thatcher also finds a form that suggests Kimball fraudulently collected insurance money on a Jeep he recently wrecked. Thatcher soon searches the home in Broomfield, where Kimball used to live with his wife. There, on the property, he finds a box trailer, which Kimball reported several weeks earlier as stolen from the front of his office. The white-collar con artist seems to be back in the fraud game, only now he's missing in action. Detective Thatcher starts a dialogue with Kimball's estranged wife, Lori McLeod. Lori soon reveals to the detective that she's suspicious of Kimball and thinks he might possibly be involved in her daughter's disappearance, which was two and a half years earlier. By the end of January 2006, Scott Lee Kimball is wanted by multiple law enforcement agencies. The U.S. Attorney's Office wants him on parole violations, while the FBI wants him in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Markham. 
federal agents get a warrant for his arrest. It takes them nearly two months before they're able to track him down in Southern California. Coachella Valley, California, Tuesday, March 14th, 2006. U.S. Marshals pursue Scott Kimball on a high-speed chase through the desert down Route 86. Kimball doesn't stop until he runs out of gas on the outskirts of Mecca, California. He gets out of his truck, kneels on the ground, and immediately surrenders. Kimball is subsequently extradited back to Colorado. Meanwhile, Boulder County, Colorado prosecutors Katarina Booth and Amy Okubo review the missing persons cases of Casey McLeod and Jennifer Markham. The feds are unwilling to launch a missing persons probe, so the prosecutors decide to build a case against Kimball for check fraud in the case against optometrist Cleve Armstrong and insurance fraud regarding his Jeep and box trailer. This will allow law enforcement to keep him behind bars until they can figure out how to prosecute him for other suspected crimes. In late June 2006, Casey McLeod's father, Rob, is online when he comes across a news article about Bob Markham's search for his daughter, Jennifer. The article mentions the name Scott Kimball, his ex-wife's second husband. Rob McLeod, his ex-wife Lori, and Bob Markham meet up at Bob's house in suburban Denver. When Markham asks Lori if there was anyone else in Scott's orbit who might have disappeared, she mentions Uncle Terry. Bob Markham and Rob McLeod then go to the Denver FBI to share the information they've compiled in auto dated the day after her disappearance. When they take the information about the receipt back to Scott and ask him about it, he explains that he was scouting hunting locations that day in the area. The authorities would later search Kimball's box trailer and find a bag containing Casey's subway hat, zip ties, in March 2006, U.S. Marshals capture 39-year-old ex-con turned FBI informant Scott Lee Kimball, who'd been on the run for more than two months. By the fall, Kimball is sent to a Montana prison to finish out a sentence for an old conviction. But back in his home state of Colorado, he faces a variety of check and insurance fraud charges, while also being the target of an FBI investigation into the missing persons cases of Jennifer Markham, Casey McLeod, and his own uncle, Terry. FBI Special Agent Jonathan Cruising and Lafayette, Colorado Police Detective Gary Thatcher embark on a massive investigation into every aspect of Scott Kimball's life. Denver, Colorado, Saturday, November 18th, 2006. Special Agent Grusing meets with Jennifer Markham's father, Bob, at police headquarters. According to Markham, when he contacted the FBI in 2004 after Jennifer's disappearance, Agent Carl Schlaff had put him in touch with her FBI handler, a man Schlaff would only refer to as Joe Snitch. Bob says he and his ex-wife, Mary Willis, met Joe Snitch in Colorado in August 2005. That's when this Joe Snitch informed them that Jennifer was dead and offered to show them where she was buried in the mountains near Rifle, Colorado. Later that same month, Agent Grusing discovers evidence of fraud in a bank account belonging to Scott Kimball's uncle, Terry. Terry Kimball had never been involved in any illegal financial fraud before, so this activity stands out to Agent Grusing as possibly the work of Scott Kimball. Westminster, Colorado, Tuesday, April 10th, 2007. Investigators interview Scott Kimball's ex-wife, Lori McLeod, at her home. They mostly talk about her daughter, Casey's disappearance. Lori allows them to look through boxes belonging to Scott, which she'd kept. Inside, the investigators find Casey McLeod's 2003 date book and her subway work schedule, as well as a receipt from the North Park Supers grocery store in rural Walden, Colorado, dated the day after her disappearance. When they take the information about the receipt back to Scott and ask him about it, he explains that he was scouting hunting locations that day in the area. The authorities would later search Kimball's box trailer and find a bag containing Casey's subway hat, zip ties, electrical tape, and a pair of women's shoes. Seagoville, Texas, Thursday, October 11th, 2007. Agent Grusing and Detective Thatcher enter federal prison to question Steve Ennis, who was Jennifer Markham's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance. Ennis confirms that back in February 2003, Jennifer was supposed to go with his former cellmate, Scott Kimball, to Seattle to start a new career. Ennis claims he saw Kimball visit with another inmate named Stephen at Englewood Correctional Institution. Ennis overheard Kimball tell the other Stephen that he and Stephen's girlfriend Leanne had been committing check frauds in the Nevada desert, but the girlfriend had ended up dead. Law enforcement quickly determines the other inmate named Stephen is Stephen Holly. They review Holly's prison visitor records and notice the name Leanne Emery pops up multiple times. They soon learn that Emery disappeared a month before Jennifer Markham. 
Grusing and Thatcher visit Emery's father, Howard, at home in Centennial, Colorado. Howard tells the investigators that before Leanne vanished, she was hanging out with a guy named Hannibal, who she'd met through Stephen Holly. Her credit cards were maxed out, and her checking account had been overdrawn prior to the discovery of her abandoned car in Utah. The situation has Scott Kimball's M.O. all over it. Florence, Colorado, Wednesday, October 31st, 2007. Agent Grusing and Detective Thatcher question Stephen Holly inside Florence Supermax prison. Holly confirms that his former friend, Hannibal, is indeed Scott Lee Kimball. Even though the evidence is mounting in the missing persons cases of Jennifer Markham, Leanne Emery, Terry Kimball, and Casey McLeod, law enforcement still doesn't have enough to charge Kimball. He remains behind bars awaiting trial for white collar crimes. Who exactly is Scott Lee Kimball? Scott Kimball was born September 1966. He spends most of his childhood in Lafayette, Colorado. At 10, when his parents split, he ends up hanging out at his grandmother's mobile home park. There at the trailer park, Kimball ends up being groomed by 41-year-old sexual predator Theodore Payton. From 1976 to 1983, Payton repeatedly takes Scott up to his cabin in Nederland, Colorado. During those trips, he supplies Scott with alcohol gets him to pose for nude photos and sexually molests him. Even though Payton would later be convicted of sexual assault and sentenced to seven years in prison, he'd already rendered Scott Kimball a broken man. In October 1989, when Scott is 23, he rents a hotel room, puts a 30-30 rifle to his forehead, and pulls the trigger. The bullet glances off his skull and lands him in the ICU. He recovers, but his cousin Ed would later say it was like Scott lost his conscience as a result of the head injury. Kimball's life as a felon begins in Montana in his 20s, writing bad checks for thousands of dollars. By 2000, he winds up in a Montana prison for violating the terms of his probation from an earlier conviction on three forgery charges. In April 2001, Kimball gets a job as a gas station attendant in Helena, Montana, as part of a pre-release work program. Yet Kimball ends up stealing money from the register and drives off in a stolen truck. While on the run, Kimball assumes his brother Brett's identity and forges nearly $25,000 in Brett's name. Kimball is finally arrested seven months later in November 2001 by Alaskan authorities. While in prison in Anchorage, he tells the FBI his cellmate is plotting to kill a federal judge, a prosecutor, and two witnesses. This marks the point at which the FBI opened him up as a confidential informant. Coming up, the downfall of Scott Lee Kimball. By late November 2007, FBI Special Agent Jonathan Grusing and Lafayette, Colorado Police Detective Gary Thatcher have compiled a mountain of evidence against ex-con Scott Lee Kimball. They believe he's responsible for the disappearances and possible murders of Leon Emery, Jennifer Markham, his ex-wife's daughter Casey McLeod, and his uncle Terry Kimball. As Grusing and Thatcher continue to build their cases, Boulder County, Colorado prosecutors continue moving forward with charges against Kimball for financial fraud. In April 2008, Special Agent Grusing visits Scott Kimball in prison. Agent Grusing has interviewed Kimball a lot, but on one particular Q&A on April 7th, something seems to jog his memory about Casey McLeod. Kimball suggests that Casey may have overdosed on drugs on National Forest land. He recalls a receipt he found dated the day after Casey's disappearance. It was from a North Park Supers grocery store near Route National Forest. Agent Grusing subsequently calls the U.S. Forest Service, saying he's in search of human remains, and he's informed that bones and a skull had been found at the Route National Forest the previous September. Agent Grusing and Detective Thatcher meet with Jackson County Sheriffs the following day. They find out that the remains belong to a Caucasian female who'd been dead for two to five years. They send the remains to the FBI lab in Virginia for further identification. It's confirmed. The bones belong to Casey McLeod. In July 2008, Grusing and Thatcher catch another big break when blood evidence belonging to Kimball's missing Uncle Terry is found in the carpet at the house in Broomfield where Scott used to live. In December 2008, Boulder County prosecutors offer Kimball a deal. The deal has two parts. First, Kimball must admit to stealing the $55,000 from optometrist Cleve Armstrong and accept a 48-year sentence as a habitual offender for his other white-collar crimes. Kimball must also lead investigators to the bodies of Jennifer Markham, Leanne Emery, and Terry Kimball. If Scott complies, he will face only a single count of second-degree murder. Scott Kimball pleads guilty to the felony fraud charges and receives the agreed-upon sentence of 48 years in prison. 
Two months later, on February 23rd, 2009, Kimball leads a convoy of investigators out to the Book Cliffs off the I-70 in eastern Utah. He claims this is where he dumped the bodies of Jennifer Markham and Leanne Emery, yet neither body is found. Three weeks after that, Kimball leads another excursion to a box canyon in the same area of the Book Cliffs. This time, law enforcement finds the human remains of Leanne Emery. An analysis of the scene reveals Leanne was kneeling when she was shot in the back of the head with a 40 caliber bullet. Kimball spends the next several weeks leading the authorities on a wild goose chase for Jennifer Markham's body. However, he does eventually draw a map for investigators for where they can find the remains of his Uncle Terry in Eagle, Colorado. On June 29, 2009, investigators search the Vail Pass in Eagle and find Terry Kimball's body on a logging road wrapped in a tarp. He had also been shot through the back of the head with a 40 caliber handgun. Since Jennifer Markham's body is never found, the original deal for one count of second degree murder is taken off the table. On October 8, 2009, Kimball is back in Boulder County District Court facing two counts of second degree murder, one for Terry Kimball and the other for Leanne Emery, Casey McLeod, and Jennifer Markham. Scott Kimball pleads guilty to both counts. He's sentenced to 70 years in prison. In this case, you're investigating murder, but Scott Kimball is out there committing all these crimes of fraud, which are really hiding his identity, which makes it more difficult to find who the murderer is. And it just adds that extra layer of complication. 